how do you survive being shot nine times? But you not only survive this ordeal, you then ride the wave and use this to become a superstar. And eventually, this leads to the downfall of a big drug kingpin. Sounds like a story from a Hollywood script, doesn't it? Still, this is no fiction or make-believe story. In fact, for the rapper who was shot nine times, he knew life had only given him two options. He either gets rich or he dies trying. This shooting was ordered by one of the most feared drug kingpins in New York. But to better understand why this rapper was shot multiple times, we have to go back to when the crack epidemic began in New York, the 1980s, and show you the story of a crack team that was making the equivalent of 500 racks per day. The Supreme Team, a group of gangsters who only knew how to live life in the fast lane. And they were led by a man who ran this team of murderers and drug dealers like a Fortune 500 company, whose product was cocaine. They had somewhat of a 24-hour delivery service. The customer base was South Jamaica, Queens, and their street cred was a course based on fear. The Supreme Team was started by a name known as Kenneth McGriff, also known on the streets as Supreme. And before we fully delve into Supreme's story, it's important to state that Supreme once said, the whole objective for me being in the game was to exit the game, but something's always gonna drag you back in. Because while Supreme became a legend on the streets, ironically, he started hustling in the streets so that he could escape the streets. Although he became one of the most feared drug lords in New York, Supreme was born in 1960 into a blue collar family. His parents were New York transit workers, and his father has said to have also been ex-military. But none of this deterred Supreme from living a life of crime. Supreme grew up in the streets of South Jamaica, was described as an intelligent student in his high school years. Smart, good-looking, and athletic. He even hoped to go to college and play football. But Supreme had the same problem that many young black men faced during this period, the temptation from the streets. Most of the men who he could refer to as role models or ones who were supposedly living the good life were all drug dealers. This was partly because most of the opportunities available for black men during this period were blue-collar or menial jobs. For many young black men who lived in this neighborhood, the drug dealers were the only tangible forms of success that they had access to. So he had two choices, break his back to get that hard-earned income or become the proverbial street hustler. His choice? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Supreme was recruited by the 5% Nation, a black nationalist movement that was influenced by Islam. He was given the name Supreme by the 5%ers. The 5% Nation believed that only 5% of the world's population were truly enlightened and knew the truth about the world. 10% of the world's population are the elites who know the truth but choose to use it to oppress and extort the remaining 85% who are ignorant. The 5% nation then made it their mission to enlighten the ignorant 85%. But some members of the 5% nation also resorted to a life of crime, and one of them was Supreme. Supreme always had a good eye for business, and he recognized the potential of the crack business to make millions. So he created the Supreme Team in 1981. The Supreme Team was a well-structured organization that was very successful under Kenneth McGriff's leadership, and this is why they were able to attract hundreds of members in a short space of time. They were primarily based in the Baisley Projects of South Jamaica, Queens, and the top member of the Supreme Team was Supreme himself, followed by Gerald Prince Miller, who was also Supreme's nephew. While Supreme was the brain of the team, Prince was the brute. Supreme always focused on the money and tried to sort issues through diplomacy and resorted to violence when there was no other option. But for Prince, he would rather shoot first and ask questions later. And like the movie Godfather, you could say that Prince is like Sonny while Supreme is Michael. Only in this case, our Michael is two years older. Supreme was arrested in 1987 six years after he started the Supreme Team. And two years later, he pleaded guilty to engaging in a continuing criminal enterprise. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison, but he only spent five years before he was released on parole in early 1994. The OG violated his parole before the year even ended, and he was sent back to prison for another two years. Prince also had his time in the can. His crimes were more serious, as he was more violent than Supreme. And in 1993, Prince was sentenced to six concurrent life sentences, plus 20 years. While both men were in jail, the man who took the charge of business was the third in rank, James Bimmy Anthony. Bimmy was never really the violent kind and was instead always focusing on money. He was always involved in hip hop as well, as he used to roll with Ron DMC, and he even used to roll with Def Jam co-founder Russell Simmons. Another major member or lieutenants of the Supreme Team was Ernesto Pinella, AKA Puerto Rican Righteous. He was one of the most notorious and feared members of the Supreme Team because of the many crimes that he committed. He was known as the loose cannon that enforced the Supreme Team's will on the streets. But ironically, he eventually testified against Prince and some of the other members of the Supreme Team because Prince allegedly slept with his wife. However, 
the ladies' man of the Supreme Team was Troy Jones, aka Baby Wise, and he was also the smartest member of the Supreme Team. Baby Wise never talked about business on the phone. He didn't take pictures. He was loyal to Supreme. Never spoke much, but everyone listened to whenever he had something to say, and he answered to no one but himself. At some point, he was making about 25 to 30k per day. Baby Wise understood what it meant to keep things on the low low. He knew when and how to cut out when things were getting too hot, and that's how he ducked a lot of big cases. Baby Wise is a free man, but no one knows where he is today, as he simply escaped into the abyss. Other members of the Supreme Team included Knowledge, Pookie, Shannon, Big C, C Just, Tucker, amongst many others. The last major member of the Supreme Team, who we haven't talked about, was Colbert Johnson, aka Black Just. Black Just was the fourth in rank after Supreme, Prince, and Bimmy. Still, he was also the mentor of the man who played a major role in Supreme's downfall. This man is also a rapper who was shot nine times. If you haven't figured it out by now, I'm talking about none other than 50 Cent. Before Fiddy could release any of his timeless hits, he was just a young man on the streets who looked up to the members of the Supreme team, especially Black Just, and of course, Supreme. Fiddy lost his mother when he was only 8 years old. His mother was a drug dealer who gave birth to him when she was 15, and this was probably why Fiddy jumped off the porch quite early. Unfortunately, by the age of 12, Fiddy was already following the footsteps of his mother and had started selling drugs. During this period, he was known as the streets as Boo Boo. The young Fiddy sent needed guidance in the dangerous streets of Queens, and the man who showed him some love was Black Just. Black Just was like his big brother in the streets. He financed the boxing gym and encouraged Fiddy to learn how to box, and he also bought him his first GS. XR motorcycle. Fiddy grew up idolizing Black Just, Supreme, and some other members of the Supreme team. But after he was released from prison in 1997, he and Fiddy's relationship began to deteriorate. After spending some years in jail, Supreme realized that life as a drug dealer was a dead end with only two options. He'd either be shot in the streets or sentenced to life in prison. So Supreme wanted to go legit. During this period, hip hop was on the rise. Supreme realized the potential of rap music and he wanted his own share. So Supreme hooked up with Murder Inc. Murder Inc. had just been created by two brothers, Chris and Irv Gotti. A year after Supreme was released from jail, the label had acts like Black Child, Ashanti, and their leading act was Ja Rule. At this time, Ja Rule was the bigger artist and Fiddy was on the up and coming. They were never really friends, but they were cordial even though Fiddy felt Ja Rule was always cold to him. Ja Rule was bringing in the money, and this is why Supreme joined Murder Inc., and he even described him as a meal ticket. Their partnership was based on mutual benefits for both parties. Supreme gives them street cred and protection from anyone who tried to mess with them in the hood, while Murder Inc. brings in the Benjamins, as he was trying to become a legit businessman. But you can only take the boy out the hood, you can't take the hood out of the homie. It was only a matter of time before Supreme had to employ some of his old tricks, and a good example of this was what happened in 1999. Ja Rule was robbed of his chain by a man named Troy, who accused Ja Rule of sleeping with his wife. So he reached out to Supreme to help him sort out the issue. Supreme ordered a man to help him get the chain back, and within 15 to 30 minutes, he had gotten that chain back. And after some time, 50 Cent and Troy were in the club kicking it together. Ja Rule was also in the same club, and saw both of them making jokes together. And this was perhaps when their beef started. A friend of mine's robbed Ja Rule. And we, I'm in a club, and I see the nigga, I'm like, hey, what's up? You know, we're chilling. We, he see me kicking it with the nigga that robbed him, and he feel like, oh shit, I shouldn't speak to this dude, because I know the kid robbed him. But I know this kid, I grew up with him. When Fiddy went to greet Ja Rule later in the club, he was allegedly brushed off by Ja and the entire Murder Inc. crew. And we all know that Fiddy wasn't just gonna accept any disrespect like that. But before he was going to do anything about it, he spoke to Supreme about it because he knew that they were doing business together. But Supreme's response was, yo, leave this little dude alone. You know they be, but this is my food. And Fiddy also confirmed that Ja Rule and his Murder Inc. homies were never about the street life even if they always claim that they were. Yo, 50, what's the definition of a wankster, man? I mean, what is that? Ja Rule, Irv Gotti. I'll tell you personally, the Murder Inc., the people that you see, like Irv, Ja, the people that are involved in the business aspect are bitches. Like, these niggas don't got no hood in them. Supreme told 50 Cent multiple times to leave him alone as they were his meal ticket, but the beef only got worse from there. Fiddy and Ja met each other at the Suicidal in Atlanta, and they were both booked to perform at the same show, and this would be the first time the duo would get physical with one another. Fiddy's manager Chaz Williams encouraged both of them to speak together and try to squash the beef, but this discussion turned into a fight as they both ended up exchanging punches. Fiddy Cent somehow ended up with Ja Rule's chain after this fight, and he wasted no time in letting everybody know about it. He dropped the diss song, Your Life's on the Line. And in that video, Fiddy's wearing the chain 
chain that he took from Ja Rule, and this was obviously the ultimate disrespect. Supreme eventually collected the chain from Fiddy and returned it to Ja Rule, but Fiddy also got a gold watch in return. Ja Rule and Murder Inc. allegedly made several moves that made it difficult for 50's career to grow during this period, and on March 24, 2000, the beef got physical again. Ja Rule and Fiddy were in the same building, but in different rooms. When Ja heard Fiddy was in the Hit Factory studio not far from him, he convinced his homies to go in and jump him because he couldn't join him as he was on crutches. Fiddy and four other members were involved in a fight with Black Child, Irv, and Chris Gotti, and some other Murder Inc. members. Yeah, what's beef? Know what I mean, beef is when you see a nigga in his studio or wherever, and the nigga want to talk, and niggas was like, nah, ain't nothing to talk about, right? It's like five of us and five of them, and niggas is getting it on and fighting and bonk some way, somehow. The lights got hit, hit off, and niggas was getting it on in the dark. Fiddy was stabbed by Black Child, but somehow managed to survive. Black Child was arrested and a judge issued a restraining order against the members of Murder Inc. and in favor of Fiddy. And this is what started the rumor that Fiddy was a snitch. But what really turned Supreme and the rest of the streets against Fiddy and also put a target on his back was the song Ghetto Quran. In the song Ghetto Quran, Fiddy not only told a story, it's like he created a movie with words. But while this song has a sick hook and it's undeniably a classic, this is also the song that almost cost Fiddy his life. Ghetto Quran is like a tell-all catalog in which Fiddy mentioned every major drug dealer, hustler, and gangster in Queens. Everyone deemed him a snitch, and Supreme stated that his behavior could be construed as dry snitching. Fiddy had also shown that he was never scared of Supreme. Now, he was also creating problems for Supreme by letting more people know about his business. And that that's when Supreme decided that he had enough. At around noon on the 24th of May 2000, Fiddy sensed friend Curtis Brown was waiting for him right in front of his grandmother's house. When Fiddy got out of the house, he checked to see if there was anything suspicious before he got into the car. He sat in the back seat because the driver's girlfriend was also in the car. Fiddy's friend then reminded him to go get his diamond cross pendant and on his way back to the car, Fiddy also took his gun with him. He noticed a car arrive on the block as he got into the car, but he didn't think much of it. But as he hopped into the car, the killer got down from his own car and started making his way to where Fiddy was. As Fiddy handed the driver the jewelry, the shooter popped out on the left and started shooting. The bullets tore into his face, his arms, legs, hip, and chest. Fiddy had a swollen tongue, a broken leg, lost his wisdom tooth, and this is what also led to his slurred voice. Fiddy was kept in the hospital for 13 days before he was eventually released. Fiddy was shot by a man known as Daryl Homo Bomb, but it was later revealed that it was Supreme that put a hit on Fiddy for 25k. And it didn't end there. Supreme made sure Fiddy's debut album, Power of the Dollar, was never released. He also lost his deal with Columbia Records after the shooting, so Fiddy surely had hit rock bottom as he tried to get revenge. He stated that he was waiting for Supreme in front of his grandmother's house in a 1993 Dodge Caravan, and he even slept in it, but Supreme somehow never showed up. During this period, Fiddy was so paranoid that he couldn't even leave his house without his pistol and a bulletproof vest, but Supreme was eventually convicted of ordering the 2001 shooting of rapper Emo money bags and big nose Troy. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole. In the aftermath of the shooting and surviving nine shots, Fiddy returned to the booth and started releasing various mixtapes, one of which caught the attention of another rapper who is probably the only person who has dissed more rappers than Fiddy. Yeah, I'm talking about Slim Shady. After hearing the mixtape Guess Who's Back, Eminem invited Fiddy Scent to LA, where he also met Dr. Dre and signed to Shady Records. And after he signed, Fiddy never looked back ever since. <laughs>